This presentation is on sports medicine, historical perspectives and hot topics of things that I have observed over the last 25 years in practice. These are the different areas that you can uh, navigate to if you would like to skip through during some of this presentation. Just click on the appropriate joint. I finished my residency in 1984, and prior to 1985, when I did my fellowships, we were doing open procedures. In the knee, we did extra-articular reconstructions. In the shoulder, we did extra-articular reconstructions. And in the ankle, we did extra-articular. In other words, we transferred tissue around the joint and didn't specifically fix the inside of the joint nor restore the true anatomy. So prior to 1985 and the advent of arthroscopic techniques and advances in the arthroscope and equipment, including uh, tissue transfer, uh, transfer of the sutures through the tissue, uh, reamers, understanding of the exact anatomic spot and how to get there, we did all extra-articular reconstructions, and this includes in the shoulder, subscapularis transfer, coracoid transfer, capsular shifts, all done open, such as the putty plat, the Bristow, the Bankart, which was an attempt at anatomic repair, putting the labrum directly back. However, we did do humeral-sided shifts in an open procedure. In the knee, we did many different types of IT band tenodeses. We did the um, Andrews procedure, which was an IT band uh, tenodesis. PES and serine transfers were done for medial instability. And oftentimes, the ACL was just left torn, and we did these procedures that were either medial or lateral tightening up or extra articular. In the ankle, there were many different varieties of perineous brevis transfers for lateral ankle instability. Oftentimes, this over-constrained the subtalar joint, and we would see stiffness in the subtalar joint and arthritis in the subtalar joint. One of the problems with these extra-articular reconstructions is that range of motion was not reestablished, and when you have a limited extension range of motion in the knee, you're going to get arthritis, patellofemoral joint, abnormal gait. If you have limited external rotation of the shoulder and the joint is over-constrained, you'll get glenohumeral arthritis, and athletes will have difficulty throwing or swimming. And again, in the ankle, you can over-constrain the subtalar joint and get arthritis. So limited motion following surgery is a bad thing. After 1985, anatomic repairs and reconstructions started, mainly because we had the arthroscopic ability to look at the, the normal anatomic attachments intraarticularly, and the arthroscope really paved the way for advances in our surgical techniques and also understanding of mechanisms of injury. When I did my residency, we made the diagnosis of biceps tendon problems very, very often, biceps tendonitis. And now we understand in the throwing athlete that the biceps tendon is usually normal in that high schooler or the college age pitcher. And it's more of a slap lesion uh, at the uh, biceps glenoid labrum anchor that the problem occurs and not in the biceps tendon itself. Shoulder pain in the thrower, biceps tendon labrum. We understand this much more because we started looking in the joint. We have had advances of what we can do with the labrum. We've got a great way of putting it back together. Now, uh, suture techniques, arthroscopically um, aided suture techniques. Prior to the 1980s, everything was biceps tendonitis. In the 1990s, we repaired probably most all of slap lesions. And in 2005, what we've learned is that the older individual, that is greater than age 40, they don't heal very well. And so now a slap lesion in the middle-aged individual 
is treated with biceps tendon, leaving it alone, debriding it, or we cut the biceps tendon and tenodese it to soft tissue. We can tenodese it to bone, or we can just cut it, and the patients do much better with doing something to the tendon than repairing a chronic slap lesion because these oftentimes will not work since it is a chronic problem. Sometimes they've had a slap tear for 20 years and we go in and try to repair it. Uh, they have anterior pain and then we have to do a second procedure of cutting the biceps tendon. So we learn by follow-up how patients do, particularly looking at different age groups and the chronicity of slap lesions. The biceps glenoid labrum complex, many procedures prior to 1985. Uh, originally uh, Hitchcock in 1948 described the painful shoulder observation on a roll of the tendon in the long head of the biceps brachii and its causation. This was published in JBJS. And now 62 years later, the biceps is still a pain generator, and I'm not sure we really have the answer for the biceps. We started repairing everything. That didn't work, and so now we're doing um, tenotomies or tenodeses. Definitely a pain generator, and probably with a slap tear, it's because of the origin of the biceps glenoid labrum anchor with compression tensile forces. To, in the year 2000, our advances in biceps tendon um, uh, treatment, we don't repair slaps in patients in their 40s. Tenodesis can be done open or arthroscopic, or we can do a tenotomy. And the question of cutting the tendon anyway, why do we do surgery if we can't repair the slap? Some people are putting the slap back down and cutting the tendon, which really makes um, no sense. So in individuals in their 40, 40s, the question is, more important question is who not to operate on than who to operate on. If we're going to cut the tendon anyway and they don't have a lot of symptoms, then perhaps we treat them non-operatively and counsel them on, look, we can't repair it, so um, live with it. Shoulder instability, the extra-articular techniques, tendon transfers, coracoid transfers, the intra-articular techniques of capsular shifts and the lateral J procedure, and you can also combine intra-articular and extra-articular uh, procedures. The um, open procedure, oftentimes of choice with a failed arthroscopic um, procedure of an anterior instability or bone deficit is the modified bristow lateral J procedure. The references uh, are here. Originally described in 1954, Latourge wrote his uh, dissertation in the middle there. The bank art is the classic repair, first reported in the British Journal of Medicine in 1923. And then we have the modified Bristow Latourge procedure. Rotator cuff repairs. The diagnosis in the pre 80s was an arthrogram. Uh, now we use MRI scans to easily diagnose rotator cuff tears. The treatment in the prior to 80s, the 1980s, was to repair the deltoid detachment. We'd have to take down the deltoid. This was a big problem of the deltoid um, tore again, more disability with that than the rotator cuff. And now we have arthroscopic anchors, many open procedures or all arthroscopic procedures to repair the rotator cuff. This is a um, new article of the Arthro Tunneler, uh, which actually is the way that we used to repair the rotator cuff in an open way, where we would use an awl and create these tunnels in the greater, greater tuberosity. Uh, and pass the sutures in an open way. Sometimes the bone is very soft and they would pull out. So the ironic thing about this arthro tunneler is it is revolutionary. Look at the literature and that's the way we did it 25 years ago. The image on the right, by the way, is an arthrogram for the younger individuals that don't know what this is. This is an arthrogram. There was no geyser in this uh, shoulder so the rotator cuff was intact. We do MR arthrograms for slap lesions, but routinely don't need to do it for other uh, 
problems in the shoulder, such as a suspected subscapularis uh, or supraspinatus tear. The Bristow procedure, which we did when I was doing my residency in Southern California, was a coracoid transfer. Oftentimes the screw um, would be very close to the joint. The coracoid may or may not uh, unite. Uh, we would take a, a two centimeter coracoid um, transfer uh, and put it down as shown here. The screw in this case is directly on the glenoid and there's no bone of the coracoid underneath it. So it is interesting to do arthroscopies on these joints that had extraarticular or perhaps in this case intraarticular placement of the coracoid. They can be very difficult to scope because they're stiff. Beware of new products, advances in techniques, or what I'm glad I did not do. I didn't do radiofrequency thermal capsular modifications. I didn't use metal staples intraarticularly. I didn't use pain pumps. I really like to use biabsorbable fixation implants. Some of these biabsorbable fixation implants, however, do not absorb. They may stick around forever. So try to pick your biabsorbable implants or peak materials and beware the multiple operated um, arthroscopic shoulder in that you may run into some of these biabsorbable fixation and have holes in the bone. Fortunately, we don't see this as often in the shoulder as we do in the knee where there can be osteolysis, particularly of the tibial tunnel with a biabsorbable fixation and then these need to be staged with bone grafting and come back for the revision at a later date. I haven't seen as much of this in the shoulder in the greater tuberosity or the glenoid. Thermal capsular modification I don't use. We hoped it was going to be successful in the multidirectional instability patient but it is very unsuccessful in that patient population and they do worse when we fry the capsule. With improvement of suture passing devices, anchors, tie instead of fry became the motto. It was very easy to pass the wand over the tissue and fry the tissue, but now when we have better suture passing techniques and we can tie knots or uh, there are some knotless anchors that are very good, uh, we tie suture uh, over the capsule as opposed to modifying the tissue itself. Dr. Andrews published there were uh, improved results in the elite professional baseball athletes with suturing, adding thermal modification, but he has seen some failures over the last 10 years, so he is now doing sutures and not frying the tissue. For those of you that don't know the thermal shoulder modification, there were monopolar and bipolar, and basically the wand would be touched to the tissue and we'd leave some tissue in between was the teaching uh, not to remove or fry the whole capsule so you'd have an area of modification and then you would have a normal uh, tissue and the direction that we did this was from the glenoid toward the humeral head but as you see this tissue being fried with the various devices uh, certainly cell death occurred um, and this was not really a good procedure to kill the cells. When cells die, they're not tight. The capsule in this case disappeared. Total capsular necrosis, that's the subscapularis muscle you're looking at anteriorly. And unfortunately, the entire capsule was um, thermalized and disappeared. So this is a very big problem in someone that is a young person who now has no capsule to deal with. Then we are back to doing transfers of tendons, um, making the joint stiff. So that's the lower portion of the subscapularis. And if you look, there's no capsule connecting the glenoid up to the uh, anterior aspect of the uh, humerus. So no capsule, no middle glenohumeral ligament which should be there, no anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, a little bit of posterior capsule but no capsule anteriorly. This case was uh, courtesy of Tony Romeo scoping six months after the thermal modification. 
So don't fry. Please tie. Radio frequency applications were in the shoulder. They were also used in the knee for patellar lateral releases, uh, meniscectomies, debridement of ligaments and stumps, and people were using this on articular cartilage defects, which unfortunately may have contributed to deeper injury and osteonecrosis of the medial or lateral femoral condyles. Didn't seem like it affected the tibia as much as the femur. Fortunately, radio frequency is not used very often anymore. Charles Dickens, take nothing on its looks, take everything on evidence, there is no better rule. I think we, we should think about this with any new development and make sure that we have established the potential complications from it in the lab prior to using it on humans. Steve Arnosky showed me um, this technique um, talking about death of the tissue so I went to my kitchen and did my thermal shrinkage of bacon by the microwave. If you look at the upper left the three specimens were center cut bacon but the one on the left is stretched out the other one is normal and the one on the right is doubled up and if you look at the different seconds uh, particularly as we go to 150 seconds the tissue responds differently if it is very thin as the one on the left upper uh, looks very fried and dead and not edible uh, and not helping to constrain a shoulder joint uh, as opposed to the one that's doubled over and certainly the capsule has different um, thickness in different people um, and there are certain parts of the capsule that might be uh, thicker, the anterior inferior capsule a little thicker and a little thicker toward the glenoid side. Thermal kills, kills capsule, cells, articular cartilage and other tissue. You might get away with it, but don't do it. What about hip pain in athletes? Groin pain prior to 1985, the most common diagnosis was an adductor strain took a long time to get over and it came back from 1985 to 1990 groin pain was an inguinal hernia or some type of an abdominal hernia fascial defect and from 1990 to present we've changed it where it's now athletic pubalgia an erectus abdominis insertional fibrocartilaginous plate injury or an avulsion of the adductor longus or the adductor brevis in the differential diagnosis of hip pain, we have to determine is the problem coming from the hip? Is it extra-articular with the tendons around the hip, structures around the hip, or is it both? Is it an iliopsoas problem? Is it a uh, IT band problem? Is it a snapping hip syndrome? Or is it related to this athletic pubalgia, uh, which is more rectus abdominis or adductor tendons, even either the insertion above or the origin below. Tom Bird has popularized hip arthroscopy and is a great diagnostician and preaches about trying to decide is it a problem more of the hip intraarticular. Hip arthroscopy will help with those conditions. Uh, when we do a workup with an MRI scan, an intraarticular injection with lidocaine is done, and this gives us another uh, diagnostic test to see if the patient got better. This would indicate that there is a significant contribution of the patient's pain to an intraarticular process. And if the intraarticular hip disorder is symptomatic, arthroscopic treatment is indicated. A lot of advances in hip arthroscopy. I don't perform hip arthroscopy. Hip pain in athletes, is it a femoral acetabular impingement? There are two types of this. There's the cam type and the pincer type. The cam type is shown in the upper right-hand x-ray. You can see that extra bump just below the femoral head. And this is called a pistol grip deformity. If you think about a gun, it is felt that this is genetically inherited or is it a developmental problem of a slipped capital femoral epiphysis? 
This was described as a premature growth arrest by Bill Harris in Boston in 1975. The pincer type is on the acetabular side, and you can see on the x-ray on the right the shelf of the acetabulum, and this was originally described by Smith-Peterson associated with a labral tear. Procedures for femoroacetabular plasty now are done, uh, where this cam-type pistol grip deformity, the concavity is restored, arthroscopic or open. Longer-term follow-up is needed to see if we can get athletes back to playing professional hockey or football with this. We see it fairly often in the young individual. More follow-up is necessary for us to understand the effectiveness of our arthroscopic treatment, and we also need to understand the causes of fibril acetabular impingement has it been here all along and we're just now getting a better hammer such as what we had in the labrum in the hip or in the shoulder is like that of the hip we are now doing repairs of the uh, labrum uh, of the hip and shoulder but if you think about the shoulder we have backed that down a little bit and debride more in the older individual so we need to know more about the natural history of development of femoral acetabular impingement perhaps getting x-rays in patients without hip pain who may have some bony changes that are asymptomatic. Athletic pubalgia is a sports hernia, but a sports hernia is not truly a hernia. So what is athletic pubalgia, which we call a sports hernia? It is an erectus abdominis insertional aponeurotic tear so that's above the pubis, and it is also an adductor longus brevis pectineus origin tear at the fib fibrocartilaginous plate, an avulsion of this, and it is thought that it might be a compartment syndrome of the adductor compartment. The workup, history and physical, imaging, there are some special series uh, of imaging, uh, MRI scans with axial oblique imaging planes, you must talk to your radiologist about what you're looking for and get an MR image specifically of this area. If you're worried about an intraarticular problem, at this point most people do an intraarticular arthrogram and again use lidocaine to see if this appears to be more of an intraarticular hip problem or an extraarticular. So get images on a good magnet with radiologists that can uh, support you and get your answers. Bill Myers is a general surgeon who uh, was at Duke and worked um, with the orthopedist um, at Duke. Bill Garrett, who has been at Duke and the University of North Carolina, was taking care of a lot of soccer athletes and got Bill Myers involved in uh, athletic pubalgia, groin pain in uh, athletes. Now, Bill Myers, who uh, practices in Philadelphia, sees 25 patients with athletic pubalgia a week and does 15 of these surgeries a week where he is um, repairing, releasing the tissues about the pubis of the rectus abdominis above and an adductor release uh, below. He's tightening up the tissues above and releasing them below and doing fasciotomies. Interesting that a general surgeon is doing this musculoskeletal work his specialty was liver transplants, but now he has uh, enough athletic pubalgia to support him. What about ACL reconstructions? In the 70s and early 80s, extraarticular IT band tina DCs were in. If we did an open ACL, ACL reconstruction, it was done open with an arthrotomy. Over the next decade, the mid-80s to mid-90s, we started doing arthroscopic intraarticular ACL reconstructions with a single bundle using most um, often in the young uh, active uh, athlete bone patellar tendon bone, sometimes hamstring, sometimes allograft. In the mid-90s, um, the importance of anatomic ACL reconstructions, 
was emphasized, particularly by Dr. Freddie Fu in Pittsburgh. He put the flag of anatomic ACL reconstructions up, and all of us have tried to improve our techniques to do reconstructions in the anatomic um, locations. We can do single bundle. We can do double bundle. We have improved fixation techniques. We understand the anatomic landmarks. We can see it better through the scope, different portals. We have improvement in guides, uh, reaming. We can do all inside or we can do inside out. Typically now, our reaming uh, is done through the anterior medial portal for the femoral side and under direct visualization for the tibial side. We used to do reaming through the tibial side. And although our results seem to be good, we were not putting the ACL in the anatomic correct spot on the femur. The femoral side is the one that we usually miss on. So I think we've come a long way with, again, making sure that we've set the bar high enough for us to do anatomic ACL reconstructions. I have always used a single bundle bone patellar tendon, usually an autograph, but also an allograft in certain situations, revision situations. And I think I put that single bundle in a pretty good spot. However, there are certain indications for a double bundle, perhaps a failed initial reconstruction, somebody that has significant rotatory instability, the lax individual, the failed ACL reconstruction. We really don't know why the ACL fails in a non-contact initial injury, so how do we know how the ACL fails when we reconstruct it? We usually say it's surgeon era, we didn't put it in the right place, but there can certainly be other issues involved with tearing our graft. Capsular ligament injuries, pre-1975, we did capsular repairs. We actually would cut out the ACL. So we'd do a good extra articular IT band tenodesis or do a repair medially of the posterior oblique ligament, posterior medial structures. And the knees did pretty well. Again, they might have gotten stiff, might not have regained full range of motion. Then we made an evolution to reconstruct the ACL, and everything was an ACL deficient knee and we started ignoring the capsule. But there are injuries to the capsule with every ACL tear. We see the lateral capsular sign, the Sagun sign laterally. So there is injury to the lateral capsule. Some people still do a pinch tuck, extraarticular IT band tenodesis with an intraarticular ACL reconstruction as uh, Dr. Houston taught us to do. But by the 2000, the capsule was back, and we have much more emphasis on diagnosing anterior medial rotatory instability and posterior lateral in rotatory instability. If we don't address those capsular instabilities, our ACL graft is going to fail because we're asking it to give us medial or posterior lateral support, which it's not going to do. PCL injuries, we reconstruct those if they're associated with medial or lateral injuries. Otherwise, a grade one or two straight PCL injury, we would treat non-operatively. There's an excellent review of the evaluation and treatment of injuries to the capsule written by Fred Flandy, Flandry of the Houston Clinic um, in 2009 that I would suggest that you uh, review uh, We have them a long way. This is a picture of an extraarticular reconstruction, the big incisions. You can see here his avulsion with ectopic bone of the medial collateral ligament in the x-ray on the lower left, Pellegrini steata syndrome. He was taken back for a manipulation because he was so stiff, manipulation under anesthesia after an arthroscopy. Big incisions, ectopic bone, limited motion. So fortunately now, we emphasize regaining range of motion and strength prior to surgery, and we see fewer and fewer arthrofibrosis problems. We certainly have come a long way from an extraarticular reconstruction to now. The concept of rotatory instability is Dr. Houston's legacy. Uh, I was privileged to work with him with a fellowship with Dr. Andrews, 
while Dr. Andrews was at the Houston Clinic. He taught me how to listen to patients and examine knees. The classic instability of ligaments was written by Dr. Houston Andrews, Cross, Moshi, in a two-part series in JBJS 1976. I think this is an excellent uh, review of what we're thinking about with physical exam, what structures are involved and injured, and then understanding what we have to put back to restore stability. This is a knee dislocation in a football athlete. The incision made in the upper uh, left was just through the skin, and in the middle there below the forceps is the medial meniscus which basically has been torn off of its deep capsular ligaments, the meniscofemoral and the meniscotibial ligaments. The tibial collateral ligament is off the femur. When I'm doing the examiner anesthesia in the upper right, this is called a, or coined, a suck sign, uh, where the skin was actually sucked into the joint because there was nothing attaching there except for the skin. So where my fingers are is where the skin is abutting on that free meniscal tissue. Uh, in the medial structures, the superficial tibial collateral ligament, the deep capsular ligaments are completely torn. This is our open bone patellar tendon reconstruction. We did a PCL repair off the femur and a bone patellar tendon reconstruction and a medial reconstruction. Posterior lateral structures were normal. So this is what a knee dislocation looks like open. Instabilities. Think about the rotatory instabilities, anteromedial rotatory instability, combined anteromedial and anterolateral rotatory instability. Anterolateral rotatory instability is the ACL deficient knee. I like to think about it more as the lateral tibial plateau rotating anteriorly on the femur. Also have a straight posterior, posterior lateral rotatory instability, the reverse pivot shift, if you will, where the lateral tibial plateau goes posteriorly. You can have combined ALRI and PLRI and also straight instabilities. When we think about knee instabilities, this is an exam under anesthesia of an individual who has anterior medial rotatory instability as well as an ACL injury and anterior lateral rotatory instability. In extension, he's stable. His posterior cruciate ligament is normal. Just palpating medial joint line and medial collateral ligament. He had a vulse this distally off the tibia. The pivot shift may not be as impressive in someone who has medial instability because there isn't a post to pivot around. This is his anterior drawer. Again, this is an exam under anesthesia. Do this in neutral, internal, and external tibial rotation. And if they have an anterior medial instability, the tibia will come further forward in external rotation of the tibia. And I'm doing, again, the pivot shift that isn't the typical clunk um, and obvious uh, in an associated medial instability as it would be if there was no medial instability. Um, typically doing this in internal rotation of the tibia is a little easier. So this is the front view of the tibia internally rotated, neutral, and externally rotated. And you can see where there is a pivot shift, but not as significant as if there was as there would be if there was no medial um, instability. And then he opens up again not in extension but in flexion uh, three plus. greater in external rotation than internal rotation of the tibia anterior drawer. Opposite side normal exam. Posterior lateral rotatory instability. This individual was hurt on kickoff. He's got that ecchymosis um, abrasion there medially where he was hit. So he has an ACL tear and also a posterior lateral rotatory instability. You can see his reverse pivot shift, so his lateral tibial plateau is going posteriorly. 
and he actually by MR had a vulsion off of the tibia, so he had an, an acute reconstruction repair um, of the posterior lateral structures and an ACL reconstruction. Don't miss a posterior lateral instability. Your ACL reconstruction must be supplemented with a acute reconstruction or repair of the posterior lateral structures. So interlateral rotator instability, we can think of these as grades. Usually the ACL is torn completely, and usually a pivot shift is positive or not, but you can think of uh, 1 plus, 2 plus. This isn't as important a grading uh, situation as with a PCL injury or a medial sided injury because these can improve over the course of time. In other words, you can have a grade 3 straight posterior that would become a grade 2 or a medial instability that improves a grade uh, with immobilization uh, in time. This is another examiner anesthesia, our test uh, of what we're doing, and then the arthroscopic associated. So when we're doing an anterior drawer, uh, this is a mop in tear of the anterior cruciate ligament, so there's nothing connected up to the femur. Empty notch sign, you can see the PCL in the upper left crossing, so the ACL is completely torn, mop in tear. And then as we're doing our pivot shift, the lateral compartment is the mobile compartment, the medial compartment more the compression department. So anterior drawer, pulling it forward here. Uh, there is nothing that is keeping the tibia from coming forward, um, intraarticularly at least. The posterior structures of the capsule certainly are, are preventing this. And then watch as I do a pivot shift maneuver. So this is um, a finesse maneuver where I'm just internally rotating, boom, from 30 to 0 degrees is the subluxation. The Lachman test um, in the awake patient is the best one for an acute ACL uh, tear. In the awake patient, the hamstrings will kick in when we do an AC, when we do anterior tibial translation, and we'll think that the ACL might not be torn. In the awake patient, it's very difficult to get a pivot shift acutely. And think about what the lateral tibial plateau is doing. It's rotating, so you have an anterolateral rotatory instability. In the pivot shift, you can see in the upper right this um, mobile uh, open lateral compartment. Typically, meniscus tears occur in the posterior horn back there, and there can be a flap tear that may not be repairable. See how much um, distance space there is in that lateral compartment? So I'm palpating the um, lateral meniscus. That's the popliteus tendon. Uh, and the meniscus laterally has more movement than that medially. There will be some variations of the anatomy of the attachment of the uh, lateral meniscus to the capsule. Fortunately, this was a normal lateral articular surface and a small tear that was stable of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So think about the lateral compartment as the mobile compartment. We see more lateral meniscus tears occur in an acute ACL tear than medial. Probably about 75% of patients with an acute ACL tear will have a meniscus tear. It may not be complete. It may not need to be fixed, but there may be a partial, as in this, um, acute ACL tear. Now I'm looking in the medial compartment on the scope uh, in the upper right. See how much uh, harder it is to get the scope back there? You have to do a reverse pivot shift to reduce the tibia to be able to see back there. And the tear pattern is more peripheral, doesn't heal as well if we repair it. In this individual, I did repair this. Um, so it's in a red-white junction, but sometimes it doesn't heal. If we let this person continue to play, that tear would propagate and they would have an unstable bucket handle tear of the meniscus. So the compressive forces in this medial compartment or what caused the medial uh, meniscus to tear. Uh, and again, think about when doing a pivot shift, that lateral compartment is moving, a very mobile compartment, and there are a lot of compression forces in the posterior third of the medial meniscus. So a typical pattern of medial meniscus tear that can be repaired but doesn't heal as well as the lateral meniscus in the acute ACL situation. When we treat ACL tears, we stabilize the knee with an ACL reconstruction. You can see here where the bone is passed up 
uh, into the ream tunnel. Uh, we do a little bit of a notch plasty just to be able to see, pick our anatomic spot. So as in this Rosetta stone of the knee, we don't totally establish a normal knee. There can be problems with the meniscus, the articular cartilage, things that we can't even measure acutely that may have to do with the enzymatic milieu that may set up arthritis down the road. Certainly if the ACL is not reconstructed and the knee stabilized, uh, they will have arthritis, uh, a given, uh, but sometimes we'll see arthritis occur in an anatomically reconstructed knee. If we have to take out part of the meniscus, that knee is not normal ever. So we can establish stability, but not normality. It's important to get patients in and see if you can follow them up uh, every year with x-rays and then better counsel them on they are developing some arthritis. I don't think we can cavalierly say that, yeah, go ahead and do everything. Your knee's normal because I did an ACL reconstruction. Put it in the right spot, usually a single bundle. As surgeons... Um, we accept if a ACL reconstruction fails that maybe we put it in the wrong place, but there's so many other factors involved in ACL tears to begin with. Um, why do they fail initially? Multiple factors. Maybe our anatomic ACL reconstruction is okay with a single bundle. Some use a double bundle. If we put it in the right spot, I think that's what we can strive for. However, we can't take all the credit for the surgery. Certainly the rehab team, uh, returning to sports, and a lot of other factors of why the ACL tears and the non-contact mechanism begin with. So I don't think that as surgeons we can take all the credit or the fault by single bundle, double bundle. We want to strive to put it in the right place. When we look at the risk factors for ACL reconstructions, this is from uh, Bruce Benyon's review of both intrinsic, which is not changeable, and extrinsic, which is changeable. The numerous factors that he looked at here, there were five significant factors in an ACL tear non-contact to begin with. Why does the ACL fail to begin with? And these risk factors were female, previous injury or inadequate rehabilitation, a narrow notch, hence a smaller ligament, games, you're going at it with more vigor, uh, don't know what the other individual is going to do, 75% of ACL tears in basketball and soccer in my practice occur in games, and the shoe type, perhaps something that grabs the ground um, more aggressively, uh, there was a soccer edge cleats that um, aren't worn anymore, and this did show an increased risk of injury if you wore these edge cleats. So we need to look back and find out more about the risk factor categories and what things we can change. The prevention programs are working. Uh, we're changing the way people land. Uh, we're doing uh, better work in core and looking at who individuals are at risk just by looking at their movement patterns. It's not anything that can be easily measured. We made a lot of advances in the rehab programs, and our program to prevent AC injuries is called the prehab program. Uh, we do sport-specific rehab. In the 80s, uh, did a lot of open chain, uh, throw the athlete on a machine that didn't really correlate with the function of what they were getting ready to do unless they were swimmers or this was their uh, kick leg. Uh, so you see the person struggling on that extension machine, which I guarantee is causing anterior knee pain in the normal individual, much less in the ACL reconstructed individuals. We did a lot with CPM. Certainly that is still necessary. However, waiting um, to do the reconstruction is what most of us do now to regain full range of motion before the reconstruction's done. And now what the emphasis on in rehab is core, uh, working with balls and bands, thinking about functions, not fancy bells, whistles, modalities, um, or machines. Doing mini squat maneuvers, the individuals on the right 
have no knee pain doing mini squat maneuvers. The left on the left is the male who has good hip over knee over ankle position. And look at the female who is in increased hip adduction, increased valgus at the knee, just doing a, a mini squat. So if she's out on a basketball court, she's already in a position that she may not be able to recover from or the position of no return. Martha Murray at Boston Children's is doing some excellent research on repair of ACL in the acute situation. She has been doing enhanced primary repair in the porcine model, suture enhanced collagen and platelet rich plasma. The early results show that the strength is similar to that of the ACL. She's continuing to do this work and it is very exciting that we may be able to do an enhanced primary repair of the ACL. We don't have the ideal graft yet. There are certain problems with any graft. So if we can have a repair situation and it works and we can put the synovial sheath back around the repair to keep the synovial fluid away from it, perhaps we can go back to ACL repairs. Dr. Fagan did research with the US Army 30 years ago and found out that repair doesn't work. So at that time with our arthrotomies and repair it didn't work. Perhaps we can change the synovial milieu, change the enzymes. So in 2011 ACL repair research looks promising. Perhaps we can manipulate healing factors, synovium around the ACL to allow healing to occur. Certainly there's cells within the synovial sheath. Uh, we also understand some of the enzymes involved in arthrosis. There's synovial fluid factors. Perhaps we can turn off some of the destructive enzymes or turn on some of the healing enzymes. I'd like to applaud uh, the Orthopedic Research Society for their continuing excellent research and look forward to how we can get the cells around the ACL, repair it, and put a sheath around it so it'll re repair itself. A continued problem that we have is the articular cartilage. Hunter in 1743 is quoted as once violated articular cartilage defects are a troublesome thing they don't heal as shown in the uh, picture on the right and also with Hunter operating on a knee many many ago. Bone bruise pattern this is a pattern of an acute patellar dislocation you can see the defect in the articular cartilage and the bruising in the anterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle we don't typically see osteoarthritis in a patellar dislocation, but we'd see articular cartilage injury and maltracking in this lateral patellar dislocation. The question with these bone bruises is what is the future with bone bruises in the lateral compartment in the typical functional pivot shift, posterior aspect of the lateral femoral of the lateral tibial plateau and mid-third of the meat of the lateral femoral condyle we end up down the road with osteoarthritis in the medial compartment so the question is can we prevent osteoarthritis and ACL reconstructed knees we need long-term follow-up the moon group headed by Kurt Spindler at Vanderbilt is doing some excellent work in our country heavy bench pressing will oftentimes result in shoulder osteoarthritis, glenohumeral osteoarthritis. The shoulder was not meant to be a weight-bearing joint. This is a ACL reconstruction that was done open in an IT band tenodesis with a staple of the lateral tibial plateau. You can see the significant osteoarthritis that occurs in the medial compartment. Again, the bone bruise is lateral. The arthritis occurs in the medial compartment. Perhaps we're over-constraining some knees or because they don't get full range of motion back, the medial compartment is over-constrained and hence the medial arthritis occurs. Sometimes this medial arthritis occurs 
even when the meniscus has not been removed, normal x-ray on the left, the typical screws that are used for interference uh, of the ACL reconstruction and an IT band tenodesis. We should think about a concept, concept of pack years on the knee, similar to smoking. We talk about pack years of lungs, uh, how many packs of cigarettes you've smoked throughout the years, increases risk of COPD, lung cancer. So maybe we need to think about the concept of pack year of knees, the additive effect of years of participation in basketball, sports, axial loading, and have a pack year of activity on knees. Certainly osteoarthritis also is genetically inherited. Uh, perhaps some markers would be helpful to know who is predisposed to have osteoarthritis. So think about the concept of pack years of basketball. In the foot and ankle, um, there are uh, improvements, advances of techniques as well. Uh, posterior impingement and Hagelin's uh, syndrome. It was an open approach prior to 2000. Now things are being done arthroscopic. This approach, the posterior aspect of the ankle, uh, prone arthroscopy. Ballet dancers with posterior ankle pain may have an ostrigonum. Uh, they may have flexor hallucis longus tenosynovitis and need a synovectomy. And the Hagelin syndrome, endoscopically now, a calcaneoplasty can be done. And the subacromial view of the foot, so to speak, um, in the subtalar joint can also be um, visualized. So the calcaneoplasty is like doing an acromioplasty of the shoulder in the foot and can now be done arthroscopically there is uh, a new appreciation of the significance of medial ankle instability uh, to repair and advance the deep deltoid. Youth elbow. Baseball pitchers typically originally was described by Adams um, as little leaguer's elbow. It wasn't really specifically defined as what structures were involved. My definition of little leaguer's elbow is a medial humeral epicondyle stress fractures. The older pitchers get an ulnar collateral ligament injury, partial tear, tear, skeletally immature individuals. The real young pitchers um, will have a medial humeral epicondyle fracture and the ulnar collateral ligament may be normal. However, there is that 14, 15 year age group where they're growing significantly and they may indeed have a ulnar collateral ligament injury. In the 1980s, we saw a great increase in osteochondritis to secans. In our country at least, this has decreased, perhaps because of our pitch count restrictions and modification in youth baseball rules. They still see a lot of OCD lesions in Japan, a lot of great articles coming out of Japan on how to treat these, but fortunately in our country over the last 30 years we've seen a decrease in osteochondritis to secans of the capitellum. In the year 2000, ulnar collateral ligament tears have become epidemic. Dr. James Andrews um, at American Sports Medicine Institute and past president of AOSSM has popularized a new group of stop injuries. Uh, we need an injury registry for childhood sports. This is an example of a 12-year-old little leaguer who was pitching five months prior. He felt a pop in his elbow. He didn't seek medical attention, sat out the rest of the season. Oftentimes these pitchers are the quarterback. He was not a quarterback, but he played football without any problems. He had had a rapid growth phase. And when he started throwing again after football season, his elbow pain came back. So he came in for an x-ray. These are his x-rays when he was initially seen. The one at two weeks, if you look at the lower portion of his medial epicondyle, there's a little avulsion. We um, kept him from throwing, and you can see the progression where this did indeed heal. This is a 
type of a avulsion where the ulnar collateral ligament is attaching that if we catch it early there is a chance that it will heal. So think about this as a little BB uh, and if you catch it early keep them from throwing which is not a natural act or from pitching which is not a natural act then it will go ahead and heal because you've eliminated the tensile forces on the medial humeral epicondyle. The appearance of this fracture is like a BB. It's a bullet uh, appearance um, in the medial epicondyle. If you keep them from pitching, it may heal. Uh, also important to do images uh, of an MRI scan to see what the UCL looks like. But basically, don't allow these kids to fire too soon, whether it's a BB gun or pitching. It'll heal if you diagnose it early. This is a 14-year-old who wasn't so lucky. He has this typical BB fracture uh, that wasn't uh, diagnosed because he didn't come in. Uh, if you look at his stress view on the right, there's significantly opening medially, and he had to have an UCL reconstruction. His baseball career ended. Kids will be kids. If you remember Tom Hanks, who played Josh Baskin in Big, I went to bed one night and I was a kid, and when I woke up the next morning, I was a grown up. Bruce Ryder, editor in chief of Mecca Journalist Sports Medicine, wrote an editorial recently on this. Let kids be kids, they're different than adults. Kids will be kids. As a 13 year old in Big, there was spontaneity, sincerity vulnerability and he describes as a 30 year old he became cynical calculated behavior of his adult workmates so we as healthcare providers must protect children from themselves and sometimes from their parents kids are not just miniature adults as a specialty orthopedic sports medicine should continue to strive to uncover the optimal means of diagnosing treating and preventing injury in this unique and important population we as healthcare providers oftentimes have to become the voice of reason and sometimes the parent to back these individuals down because they're going to want to continue to compete even though they're hurt. Make the diagnosis and keep them out of the game long enough so they can heal and go ahead and have a career in whatever they want to have a career in, including professional baseball. So this 13-year-old big pitcher syndrome. Uh, he's skeletally and mentally immature. He has a fast growth phase, poor pitching mechanics. He has hip weakness. Look at the opposite hip in baseball athletes. Oftentimes their hip on the opposite side will be weak. And all of this creates an upper extremity overuse injury. We must protect our young athletes, reduce the rate of rotator cuff tears, ulnar collateral ligament tears in our young pitchers. This program uh, that is championed by Dr. Andrews is the Sports Trauma and Overuse Prevention. This is the website, sports, stopsportsinjuries.org, and the goal is to keep kids in the game for life. I would uh, encourage you to sign up for this STOP program. You can become an advocate. You can spread the word locally and stop these overuse injuries from occurring. I really don't think it should be a stop program, however. It should be a go program. It should be a go and participate in activities. Um, the children and the parents, so this is not meant to be a negative program. It's more of one to uh, go be fit and everyone should be encouraged to work out, be physically active, and stay healthy. So this should be a go program and never get to the injury uh, portion. Uh, so the spin should not be stop activities. It should be go out and participate, but be safe. And if there is pain, see a healthcare professional. Unique aspects, young athletes feel no pain. Their goal is to please their parents, peers, coaches. And we really do have to protect them from themselves. Um, this is a, a young boy who's saying, let me pitch, coach. My parents need something to hang their hopes on. 
and now maybe a way to get scholarships. Um, so there is a financial drive with getting uh, kids to stay in the game. Injections part of 1985, we did a lot of steroid injections, a lot of cane injections, including um, uh, before games, which fortunately I never really did in our athletes. Uh, now we've got PRP injections. There really is no scientific evidence and studies on the effectiveness of this in uh, athletes. Heinz Ward had his medial collateral ligament injected just before the Super Bowl, and he returned faster to play, played in the Super Bowl. So this is uh, anecdotal evidence. Um, I think we should do scientific randomized studies um, in a good design to be able to answer the question of PRP injections. Beware new injections and patients who come in insisting on the treatment um, if you don't have scientific evidence that it works. Do no harm. PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Uh, the key is platelet activation. Uh, Ultrasound-guided um, injections in the soft tissue and joint are the rage. Intraop repair, uh, do we put PRP around rotator cuff repairs, Achilles tendon repairs? The jury is still out on whether this is blood doping. The International Olympic Committee and other organizations have not yet regulated uh, plasma, platelet-rich plasma. Beware of new drugs and devices, which seem to be too good to be true. Great ads that um, our equipment companies, our drug companies have. The lawyer is in sheep's clothing. Beware of new techniques, laser, robotics, the implants. Arthroscopy has allowed a better understanding of biomechanics failure of tissues and improved methods of repair. So we figured out, particularly in the shoulder, how tissues failed with the peel back of the slap uh, mechanism of injury. I would not implant a device that you wouldn't put into your own body. And what really hasn't changed over these 25 years is the anatomy. Know the anatomy, both open and arthroscopic. Other things that haven't changed is examining patients, taking a history and a physical. These things will never change. They'll be with you forever. If you can make the right diagnosis, the treatment is successful. And what doesn't change is communication, understanding techniques of history taking, physical exam, and communication with the entire medical team and families the coaches, the administrators, the parents. This is done through an effective medical team that includes physicians, orthopedic surgeons, primary care physicians, and athletic trainers. I had some great times on the sidelines with Dr. Houston, shown on the left, and Dr. Andrews. to Dr. Houston's left. Who teaches us ethics? Our parents initially, in practice, ethics were taught by the way we practice, our role models in residency and fellowship. We should communicate more with other physicians and always, always practice ethically. Do the right thing, always, no exceptions. That's what my mother taught me. Uh, she uh, awarded me a medal at the um, Kentucky High School State Athletic Association where I was inducted into the Hall of Fame. That was a great moment. So always do the right thing. Will Rogers said even if you're on the right track you will get run over if you just stand there. So I like being involved in multiple groups. This is the ACL study group which met in Bangkok uh, where Dr. Shanine allowed me to scrub and taught me his technique um, so we have to keep up or we will get run over. Dr. Thomas Brower was the uh, first chief of orthopedics at University of Kentucky from 1968 until 1989. 
uh, and he had some uh, research. Uh, he was a great teacher and a researcher. He was the first to show that both epiphyseal and articular cartilage chondrocytes can divide. He showed that nutrition support of articular cartilage is through perfusion of intraarticular fluid. Obviously, as Hunter stated, it is a bothersome thing, that articular cartilage, so we need to continue to strive for research uh, in sports medicine, in uh, joint articular cartilage. Uh, we're continuing to do that at the University of Kentucky with Dr. Latterman's leadership. We've had many changes in uh, UK orthopedics and sports medicine. This is our sports medicine team and our new location on Perimeter Drive. Um, UK sports medicine. We must communicate with our peers. Uh, don't stay in your foxhole. Communicate by phone, email, however, talk about cases, and we should learn from each other. It's great to be able to teach with the UK residency program. Our residents uh, ask us hard questions and allow us to continue to try to get the answers for them the bright stars of uh, future research as well. Our program chief, Darren Johnson, has taken us from a division to a department and has uh, allowed for great improvements in our program. Keep up with your fellowship societies. This is the American Sports Medicine Institute fellowship meeting. I would also like to thank my Orthopedic Guild members who have been an inspiration to me and my career. Don Ball taught me a lot about care and management of patients and inspired me to go on to have a very meaningful career in sports medicine and orthopedic surgery. Thank you, Guilders. It's been great.